The Panasonic Lumix S52 and S52X are some of the best value mirrorless cameras on sale today. And Lumix just gave us an update that's made them even better. The best thing is it is totally free. So in this video, we're gonna find out, is the AF actually improved? Can the IBIS even get any better? And is the proxy workflow even worth it? What does this firmware upgrade offer? Well, if we head over to Lumix's website, we can basically break it down into three main upgrades. But before I go any further, I'm gonna take this moment to mention that my knowledge on photography isn't great. I've been capturing video for around 15 years, so I prefer to stick to what I know. For this video, I'll just be focusing on the video side of this upgrade. The three main upgrades in Lumix, as own words, are number one, enhancement of production workflow. This, in plain terms, can be broken down into two features. The first one is proxy recording in camera, and the second one is camera to cloud capture. We will be going over both of those a bit later. Two, real-time auto focus recognition. Simply put, this just means lots of new additions and tweaks to the auto focus system inside the Panasonic. Number three, enhanced EIS performance. This basically is just a new, more powerful, image stabilization mode and you best believe we're going to be testing and comparing that right so if you are new to the channel i have tons of s52 videos from best lenses to best autofocus settings and even more on the way so make sure to subscribe not to miss those upcoming videos and let's get into these new features it's worth mentioning that this firmware update is going to be available from lumix's website on the 22nd of april Lumix was kind enough to send me an early beta version of this firmware to create this video and do some testing. So that being said, there may be some slight tweaks before the final version goes up for download. I've not noticed any glitches or bugs throughout my entire testing, so to me, it seems pretty solid. So let's start off by taking a look at the new Proxy recording feature. This is probably more important than you are initially thinking. Unless you have the S52X, then the best recording formats that you can capture inside of the S52 capture in a format called H265. So for anybody who does not know what H265 is, it is a form of compression. Now this is fantastic as it's the latest and greatest and it helps bring those big file sizes down so you can fit more on your hard drives and SD cards. The major downside to H265 is if you are on an older computer or Mac, then you are probably going to have a pretty bad time when it comes to editing. With the option to capture proxies inside the camera, no matter how old your computer is, you're going to have a fantastic time in editing. And after you have finished your edit, just at the very last moment, you can swap back to those H.265 files to render out the highest quality possible. The only real downside I can see to creating these proxies in camera is at the moment, the only option is to capture to the second SD card meaning at all times you need two SD cards in the camera. So what are these proxies like to edit and how do they compare to the original footage out of the S5 II? The first thing you want to do is drag your camera originals into your editing software. Here I'm using DaVinci Resolve. The next step is to select the clips inside your bin and press Relink Proxy Media. We then need to show DaVinci Resolve where those proxy files we captured to the second SD card are. They have a little proxy name on the folder. Now you're up and running. Here in DaVinci Resolve, you just use the proxy toggle to the right of the viewer to swap between the originals and the proxies. The quality is actually pretty good. There is a little hit, but for editing purposes, this is fantastic. The second part to capturing proxies in camera allows the capture to cloud feature. Now this also works with JPEGs, and to me that sounds unbelievable for like sports and live events. But for my testing in this, I'm only going to be testing out the proxy videos. So to get this feature up and running, jump over to Framio's website and create a new project. The setting we need to enable here is the C2C connections. Once you've got this setting turned on, just go ahead and create your project. Next, you will see the tabs across the top and we need to go to the one that is C2C connections and click add new device. Under here, you don't wanna do any more and we need to jump over to the Lumix. Over in the Lumix settings, go down to the spanner icon, then come down to in and out one and you'll see frame IO. 
on here just click on frame or connections and press set and then you want to click pair this will then ask you to connect to a wi-fi connection for this example i use my mobile phone as i feel that it's going to be more of a real world scenario once you have an internet connection it will then give you a pairing code you take this code back to the frame or your website and just enter it like so and just like that you are then up and running you can now see that the frame io project is empty going back over to the lumix you'll see this screen here and the last setting you need to make sure that is turned on is proxy recording choose the flavor you would like between low medium and high for this example i chose medium and just make sure it's turned on but next we just press record on our camera here i just recorded a six second clip and if you look in the top right of the screen you can see there is a little symbol representing we are uploading to frame io if we just wait a couple seconds you'll then see that it picks up the file is uploading you then jump into the folder you can see the upload has finished it is generating a thumbnail and we are good to watch the clip scrub through the clip or even download the clip do whatever we would like Let's get into IBIS. So for anybody who doesn't know how that works in the S5 II, there is basically three different modes. The first one is just IBIS. This is just the physical sensor being moved on that little gimbal-like device inside of the camera. And the second mode is called E-Stabilization. Now what this does, it is uses software, the same way you would in Premiere or Resolve, to stabilize the footage on top of the already physically moving sensor the third and final mode is called boost is now this is sometimes referred to as tripod mode as it should only ever be used when you are not panning or tilting or moving the camera in any ways so where is the new ibis mode well it is inside e stabilization this was the second mode we just talked about the way to think about this is off and standard are just the same as before but we now have the new high setting. The downside to using e-stabilization, and this was the same before the update, is when you turn it on, you get a slight crop into your image. I believe it is like a 0.1 crop, nothing crazy, but you just lose the edges of your frame. Now, when you go into the new high mode, you have a much bigger crop. My guess would be you're punching into around Super 35 or APS-C, size format you'll be happy to know that this is probably the best image stabilization i have ever seen period i'm not saying i've used every image stabilization out there there may be better ones but for me and what i've used between my sony cameras my lumix cameras my gyro stabilization this beats everything there's a few times i've used this mode where i've actually thought I don't think many people could tell that was not shot on a gimbal. If you look at the shot here on screen now, this is done with me just handhelding the camera. No handles or rigging, just the stabilization that is being done in camera. And as you can tell, the results are pretty incredible. Finally, another benefit I have found with this new stabilization mode. I've not seen anyone else talk about this, so it's very untested. You're best off doing your own test before you take my word for it. But it pretty much removes all signs of rolling shutter. There is quite a big delay in the footage if you wave it this fast as there is so much internal processing going on inside the camera. But when you do watch the footage back, this looks like a really, really good low millisecond rolling shutter camera. As I mentioned before, the new Ibis mode takes us into a super 35 millimeter crop. This means that when we are recording in 6K open gate with this new IBIS mode enabled, we are now capturing a super 35 millimeter open gate. This is actually really good because it now allows us to use all those super 35 millimeter lenses. A great example of this is I'm currently testing the new Lauer Ranger Cinema Zoom with the ones designed for super 35 millimeter cameras. And that zoom lens paired with this new mode works incredibly well. Me personally, I'm super impressed with this new IBIS mode. I never seen anybody online in any comments asking for better IBIS from Lumix cameras. And Lumix have provided us with something we did not know we even wanted. And unless you want a super wide angle shot, then I don't see many downsides to using this mode when it's needed. Next up, I'm going to dive into the brand new AF features that came along with this update. But right before I do that, I just want to tell you if you own an S5 II or S5 II X, 
and want to get the best possible video out of your camera, then I have the perfect guide just for you. In this guide I've created, I go into every single aspect when it comes to capturing and creating amazing video with the S5 Mark II. There is over three hours of content that I've broken down into different chapters and sections so you can find whatever individual aspect you need. Whether that's autofocus, IBIS, capturing raw, color grading, rigging, setting up accessories, you name it, it will be somewhere inside this guide. And by purchasing this guide, you will automatically become a member of our S52 community. I am personally in there and there is other like-minded owners that can help you answer any problems and issues you may have. And for a final bonus, I'm currently working on a bonus section that I'm going to add deep diving and working out how to get the best possible out of these new features with this brand new firmware update. If you want to find out more about what's inside the guide, the link is going to be in the description. Now let's get into the new AF features. So let's go through them one by one, starting off with Animal. I'm not 100% sure how this mod works and if there's like a list or of animals inside it. I've only been in and around my local area and we definitely don't have any kind of exotic wild animals around here, but this AF feature definitely works beyond say cats and dogs. It detects like birds and squirrels, all different shapes and sizes, and it even does a really good job of finding their eye. And that obviously means we get two options inside the animal detection. There is body or eye and body. For me, I would pretty much always leave this on eye and body. As I guess, if you are trying to capture an animal, more than likely you want its eye to be in focus. Moving on to car and motorbike, and I'm going to talk about these two together. That's because one of the confusing issues when it comes to these two is they are very similar. Sometimes when you are in motorbike, it can pick up a car. and Sometimes when you are in car, it will pick up a motorbike. Also, when you're in car, it may pick up trains. Looking at the footage here of this lawnmower, and when in car, it picked it up absolutely perfect, doing an amazing job. When moving over to motorbike, it still detected it and picked it up. And it did a relatively good job. It just did a way better job when selected in car. My advice for this mode is as vehicles tend to change from country to country, area to area, it's just test it out. Overall, it works brilliant. And I think after you've tested it a couple of times with your kind of local vehicles, you would be able to know which mode would work perfect moving on to what is probably going to be the most used af mode in this camera and that is capturing people so let's get on to the good stuff what has changed about the af in this camera well overall there is just improvements everywhere this camera now just has better autofocus i have my autofocus pretty in the middle on response and speed how does it yeah if we go way under exposed exposed that is still picking up my eye. That is pretty incredible. So let's try the same again, but let's go overexposed this time. Remove my ND filter. It's lost my eye, but it still has my face all the way at the brightest it can possibly be. One of the biggest complaints people had when it comes to AF in the Panasonic was the way it locked onto subjects well again i'm happy to tell you this has improved dramatically i can say with a lot more confidence now that when there is multiple people in the shot it will pretty much stay locked onto the subject you want you can use the little joystick on the back of the camera to easily swap between people it will track their faces it works fast and efficient. It's far from perfect, but no autofocus system is. This is a massive jump in the right direction. And for me, this takes it very close to the likes of Canon and Sony when it comes to locking onto subjects. And lastly, there is the open tracking mode. This is the mode where if you want to move the camera or the object in the frame is moving, then you will use the touchscreen to tap it and it will try its best to lock onto that object. For me here, this mode remains pretty much the same. There was a few shots when I was testing where I thought it may have improved just a little bit, but that could also be some kind of placebo effect. Remember, if you want to deep dive with me into this AF system, finding out what's good and bad and what really works, the link to my guide is in the description below. And if you want to know what lens I would run for this AF system, watch this video here.